This is Love Your Work. On this show, we help you make it as a creative. I'm David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, please hit subscribe on your podcast app and sign up for the Love Mondays newsletter. I've studied history's greatest creatives, and each Monday, I share with you the very best lessons I've learned along the way. It has taken me thousands of hours to learn these secrets. You can learn them in two minutes a week for free. Sign up at cadavy.net slash Mondays. That's cadavy.net slash Mondays. Now, what if your smartphone didn't distract you? What if your focus couldn't be shaken by social media, by the latest news story, or even by your coworkers? What if you could be indistractable? Imagine what you could accomplish. Nirayal's new book will help you do just that, become indistractable. It is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life, and it will lead you away from distraction so you can get traction. Now, you may remember Nir being on Love Your Work a couple of times before. We talked about the societal implications of distracting technology more than three years ago on episode 21. Oh, we were just babysitting. Now he's back to show you how to fight back distractions, whatever the source. In this conversation, you'll learn, Nir wrote the Bible on building habit-forming products. Hooked is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. So why would Nir also write the book on how to avoid being distracted by these products? He'll explain himself. How can you reimagine distraction to short-circuit it at its source? Nir helps you redesign your triggers, your task, and your temperament. And why is the myth of multitasking a myth in itself? Nir shows you how multi-channel multitasking can help you do two things at once while being as focused as ever. Full disclosure, Nir is a book marketing client of mine. I consulted for him on some marketing tasks for this book, Indistractable. Of course, I rarely take clients. I only did it because I respect Nir so much as an author and as a thinker and because I loved the book. Thank you so much to our generous Patreon supporters. Our supporters literally make this show possible. They currently cover almost every penny of the costs of producing this show, hosting the audio, getting it to your ears each week. Now, why would you pay for something that you can enjoy for free? Eliezer says, because I asked, as a freelance writer and publisher, I find David's insights to be very helpful and encouraging. In particular, I've especially gained from his interviews with successful and creative people, which has introduced me to approaches and techniques that have significantly improved my life and my work. Thank you, David. Thank you, Eliezer. If you are like Eliezer, if what you learn in these episodes has helped you succeed in your life and your work, give value for value. Support on Patreon. Just a coffee a month really, really helps. And you don't have to support just because you're a good person. There are all sorts of benefits, including bonus masterclasses to help you grow your business. Check it out at patreon.com slash cadavy, or if you're on the Overcast player, just click on the little dollar sign icon on your player. Otherwise, go to patreon.com slash cadavy. And thank you for mentioning my work on social media. No Identity UK shared episode 187 with Dr. Robert Maurer and said, thank you, David, for inspiring our life. I got a lot of positive response on that Kaizen episode 187. I'm really glad people found it so useful. That episode was also shared by Michael Poznev, who says, thank you at Cadavy. Thanks also to Jeff Poisel for the shout out. Indie Hacker was asking people on Twitter where they learn about growth. And Jeff mentioned my work along with all sorts of esteemed company, including Aubrey Marcus, Daniel Pink, Paul Jarvis, and Farnham Street. And uh, when I thanked Jeff for that flattering recommendation, he said, thank you for everything you put out into the world. It's been valuable on my quest for personal freedom, creative expression, and building a business. Cheers. Thank you right back at you, Jeff. Finally, over on Instagram, we have at Tom Jepson Creative. Tom has been sharing up a storm and has been getting the shout outs on Love Your Work to go along with it. Tom shares the long episode 189 with Robert Wiblin and says, I'm going to invest a couple of hours enjoying this conversation on at Academy's podcast. Love your work. Thank you again for that, Tom. 
You help the show grow when you share my work. And there happens to be an exciting new way for you to share the show. It's really cool. It's on Overcast. As usual, it seems like Overcast users get all the cool stuff. The next time you hear a provocative insight on the show that you want to share, you can quickly and easily share a really cool video and audio clip. On the top right of your player, tap on the share button. It's a little box with an arrow shooting up out of it. And then tap on share clip. And then from there, you can select the section of audio that you'd like to share. And Overcast will make a clip that is perfectly ready for you to share on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or wherever. Share a clip, mention me. I will be sure to thank you on the show. Now, here is Nir Eyal. I'm here with Nir Eyal, who is the first member of the Three Timers Club here on Love Your Work. I'm actually doing a victory lap right now <laughs> around my office. This is awesome. I'm so happy that I'm the first member. Yes. And uh, we're here to talk about your new book, Indistractable. And uh, I guess the, the elephant in the room is that you wrote a book called Hooked, which is all about how to build habit-forming products. And now you've written this book, Indistractable, which is like how to keep yourself from getting distracted by habit forming products. So, w- what do you have to say for yourself here? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm being facetious there. I'm not sorry. Uh, I'm not sorry because Hooked was all about how to build habit forming products for good. Uh, I talk about in the book about uh, the difference between habits and addiction. The book is not called How to Build Addictive Products, it's called How to Build Habit Forming Products. Mm-hmm. And that's for a very mm-hmm. specific reason. Uh, and you know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we, we, the book did great. We sold 250,000 copies so far, but I'm not sure how many people got to the actual end of the book because if they did, they would see that the case study, the only case study, proper case study in the entire book is the Bible. That's the case study hmm. I use to exemplify uh, habit forming products. And I put that case study in the back of the book for a very specific reason that what you think about the Bible and religion, for that matter, says a lot about what you would think about habit-forming technology. Because if you believe that the Bible gives people purpose and guidance, solace, helps them find meaning in, the, in life, and it's a good thing, then you'll be all for the application of habit-forming products. But if you think religion divides people, and is not helpful, is not a, a force for good in the world, you're going to think it's a bad use of habit-forming products. And so that was my subtle way, nudge, nudge, of showing that this isn't about the value judgment of the technology. You know, you can substitute Facebook for the Bible app and you'll get very similar results. That if you think that Facebook is a force that brings people together, which I think it does, or if you think it's a force that brings people apart, which I think it does, uh, then that shapes your opinion. But I think that the use of this, uh, these techniques is something that should be democratized. That we want products to help form healthy habits. And I have never worked for Facebook. I don't own any shares of Facebook. I don't work for gaming companies, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, pornography, machine gambling. There are certain companies I will not work for, those that prey upon addicts, as opposed to those who create addicts as an unfortunate byproduct. So I do have an ethical code of how to use this stuff. Um, but for the vast majority of the companies I work with, probably every single solitary one of your listeners right now, they are not struggling with addicting anybody, right? These are business people by and large who are building products and services that would benefit people's lives if people only use them. And so that's my audience for Hooked. That was, the book was always written for people to build healthy habits. And I talk about, there's a section in the book called the morality of manipulation for this exact reason. And so thank goodness, uh, you know, we're coming up on the five-year edition. And so I, I updated some new case studies in the book. And uh, thank goodness that the case studies are, are of companies that have used this methodology for, for great, great things. Companies like Kahoot, the largest educational software in the world, uses the Hook model. Fitbod is a company that helps people form exercise habits in the gym. Um, Paga has brought millions of previously unbanked people in sub-Saharan Africa online for the first time, giving them bank accounts. These are great habits. So that's what building habit-forming technology is all about, is about using this stuff for good. And there's no dichotomy between using this stuff for good 
and warning people as an industry insider, who would you want to tell you how to put this stuff in this place better than the person who knows exactly what they're doing? And so that's really the genesis of, of Indistractable is that I saw that I was becoming distracted, that I wasn't doing what I wanted to do, and hmm. uh, that I initially blamed the technology. I thought, oh my God, you know, I, I understand how this stuff works and, and look, it's doing it to me. Uh, but then what I thought would be a book about getting rid of, well, sorry, I should say, I, I thought the answer was about getting rid of technology because that's what all the other books say to do. Every book on focus and productivity and, you know, life hacks basically say, get rid of the technology, but that didn't work for me. I tried it all. <laughs> it didn't work. So that's where I started this deep dive exploration of what does work. And so the book is really about distraction at large. You know, there's distraction has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, Socrates and Plato talked about it 2,500 years ago. They called it akrasia, this tendency that we have to do things against our better interest. And so it's not a new problem. What's new is that we have these, uh, these access to distraction like never before. That, uh, I will, I will tell you as an industry insider that in this day and age, if you are not prepared, they're going to get you. No doubt about it. These companies are designed, their business model is designed to mm-hmm. get your attention. Uh, and if you don't, choose your life, if you don't decide how you're going to spend your limited attentional resources, then they will decide for you. And it's not just the tech companies. It's your boss. It's your kids. It's your spouse. It's the news. It's Donald Trump. These people will eat up your attention and time unless you decide how you want to spend it. And that's what being indistractable is all about. It's about living with intent. It's about doing what you say you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you you were saying that you got to this point where you were falling victim, or I guess not victim is probably not the right word or not the word that you want to be using here, but you were getting distracted by, by these, these products. Like what, what did that look like for you? How did you get to the point where you're like, I've got to write a book about how to be indistractable? Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 the real turning point for me was with, when I was with my daughter and we were, we had this afternoon together, you know, daddy and daughter time. And we had this book of different activities that daddies and daughters could do together. And one of the activities in the book was to ask each other this question. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I wish I could tell you what she said, but I can't because in that moment, uh, I was distracted. I was on my phone. Uh, some stupid thing had uh, distracted me. Uh, or I let myself get distracted, I should say. And my daughter got the message and she left the room. And uh, when I looked up from my phone, she was gone. And so that's when I, I realized I, I had to do something here. Because it, if, I, if I was honest with you, and I, I tell you that this wasn't a, a singular incident, it, it happened more than I'd like to admit. It mm-hmm. happened when I was uh, distracted at work. I'd sit down to write. You know, you know how hard it is to write. It's it's very difficult many times to, to to keep cranking out words. It's not always something that you get into instant flow. At least for me, it's really hard work. So many times, you know, I, I found myself uh, procrastinating or getting bored and going on YouTube or or Googling something or you know doing doing worky stuff. Right? I'll just check email for a minute. That feels like work. That's productive, right? And then I wouldn't get the hard work done. Mm-hmm. And so I really wanted to figure out what was going on. Um, so I, I bought every book on the topic. They're, they fill the shelves behind me. And basically the answer was always, you know, get rid of the technology. It's, it's about digital minimalism. It's about dig, you know, uh, 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 digital detox, a 30-day plan. And so I did that. I, uh, I went and bought a feature phone that only does, uh, sends, you know, receives calls and sends text messages. And I got myself a word processor from 1990s from uh, eBay. They still sell them. And uh, I thought, okay, great. I've solved the problem. This is it. Uh, the books, you know, all these experts told me what to do. Just get rid of the technology. And it didn't freaking work. And it didn't work for the same reason that uh, I, I had such trouble losing weight. So I used to be clinically obese for many years of my life. Yeah. So, wow. uh, and I, I, well, thanks. But, yeah, but it's, it's always been, I actually, I credit that for giving me this, uh, the insight into what it means to like struggle with something controlling you as, as food, uh, controlled me for a very, very long time. Uh, I, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes my friends will say, Oh, you have such willpower or whatever. You have such self-control. I'm like, no, that's exactly the opposite. I don't. That's why I needed a system. That's why I write what I write and why I do that. What I do is because I want to understand why these things control me. And so that's, you know, that, that gave me a lot of insight into, into these behaviors. So what I used to do when I was clinically obese, I would go on fad diets. 
you know, one week it was no fat, the other week, no carbs or whatever, you know, 30 day plan of no junk food. And, and of course, guess what happened on day 31? You know, I made up for lost time. I need everything I could possibly get my hands on. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what happens with these 30 day digital detox plans. Because just like a fad diet doesn't work, excising technology from your life doesn't work because we're not dealing with the real sources of distraction. Distraction isn't caused by technology. It's a symptom of a deeper problem that we use technology, uh, entertainment, pacification, Mm. drugs, booze, whatever you, you call it, to get out of our heads, to find relief from uncomfortable emotions. And if we don't deal with those uncomfortable sensations, the real reason that we're driven to distraction, then we'll always get distracted by something. But I, I hadn't seen a methodology for how to cope with, with the real cause of distraction. So that's why I decided to, to find the answer for myself. Well, and you were saying earlier that distractions kind of, it's nothing new or, I mean, when I hear that, I'm like, well, but this is, it's different now. Is it, is it not different now? Is there, are there not more, uh, things that are, commanding our attention, uh, than ever. Like, yeah. are we just like trying to not blame somebody for this or what's, what's the strategy here? Yes. And yes. Uh, so is it different? It's different in that if you are looking for distraction, if you have a predilection for distraction, it's easier than ever to find, mm-hmm. right? They're going to get you. If you're looking for it, uh, they're going to get you. So there's this great Kierkegaard quote that I love that he said, anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's, that's such a great encapsulation of our time because we have so much choice these days, right? There are limitless articles to read. There are unlimited videos to watch, unlimited debates that you can engage in, information to absorb. It's, it's dizzying. And so if you are looking for distraction, it's easier than ever to find. However, it's not their fault. It's not your fault either, actually. It's not your fault. You didn't make Facebook. You didn't make YouTube. You didn't make email. Mm. But guess what? It's your responsibility because we have no choice. These things aren't going away. It's too late. And frankly, we need them. You know what? I, I, my business, your business, my business couldn't survive without these technologies. I mean, look, we're talking right now for free across thousands of miles with these tools to create content that we will then spread on social media. <laughs> and by mm-hmm. and large, it's great. I mean, we wouldn't even be friends without some of these technologies. We would have never met. We've actually never met in person. We've never met in person. Great point. Yes, we've never met in person. And I, and I consider you a close friend. Uh, and, and so we need this stuff. The idea here is not to create a big bad bo- boogeyman, which every generation does, uh, uh, right? Like, uh, what was it? Douglas Adams that said that everything that's invented after you're the age of 35 is against the natural order of things, oh, right? right? Every, we, we have this natural aversion to every new technology. It must be evil. It must be, you know, messing with our heads. Every new technology does this. But of course, everything that came before us was also a new technology at one time that now we're no longer scared of. So the idea here is, how do we get the best of these tools without letting it get the best of us? while also mm-hmm. not forgetting that there are all sorts of distractions out there that have nothing to do with technology, right? If you think about you know, a coworker stopping by your desk, this is one of the most common sources of distraction is the open floor plan office. Hey, David, what's going oh, on? You want to chit chat for a bit? No. That's a distraction, <laughs> right? And so we got to deal with it, but nobody talks about it, right? Because there's no big bad company to blame. Yeah. Hmm. yeah so we, we have to get out of the get off my lawn trap uh, yeah. that, like, <laughs> oh, this is just, you know, all the new stuff is the world is, is going to, he- to hell and, and, uh, and, and this is all hurting me. We have to take control, take responsibility for what's going on. One of the things that I, I really liked from the book is time management is pain management. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So, um, let's start with how do we answer this question of why we get distracted? To me, this is a really fascinating question because, you know, so much of what we are told in the personal development self-help industry is about the, this hypothesis that isn't, hasn't really been tested that much of, you know, you just don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. If you only knew what I know in this book, and of course it's ironic here because I wrote a book, you wrote a book. But the idea here is that if you just knew what to do, you would do the right things. And that is true in some cases at the upper limits of knowledge. But the fact is for the big issues, we already know what to do, right? You want to be healthy? By and large, 
80% of the problem, 80% of what you got to do is eat right and exercise. Okay. We don't need to buy a book to tell us that. If you want to have good relationships, it's about being fully present with the people you love. If you want to be great at your work, you know what? You got to do the goddamn work. <laughs> it's not rocket science, right? You got to put in the yeah, effort. How do you write a book? Yeah. You sit uh, down. So write some words. You write it. <laughs> right. So the problem to me wasn't that I didn't know what to do. It's that despite knowing what to do, I didn't do it. And so that's why I think distraction is such an important topic and why becoming indistractable is the macro skill of the century. Because if you can just do what it is you say you're going to do, that's a superpower. That's a superpower I would want is to just Mm -hmm. be accountable for what I say I'm going to do, to be honest with myself. I would constantly lie to myself. Oh, I'm going to work out. I didn't. Uh, I'm going to do that big, uh, I'm going to write today and I, I, I slack off. I, you know, I, I would constantly do this and lie to myself. So I had to ask myself, Okay, first, why do we get distracted? Well, let's go a layer deeper. Why do we do anything? Like really first principles, what's the nature of motivation? The nature of motivation, I thought, uh, is the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. This is called Freud's pleasure principle. Uh, Jeremy Bentham Mm -hmm. came up with it before that too. You know, this is an old idea. It's carrots and sticks. Exactly, exactly. Pain and pleasure. But turns out that neurologically speaking, what motivates us is not pain and pleasure, it's pain all the way down. That's it. Even the pursuit of pleasure, wanting, craving, desire is psychologically destabilizing. It's uncomfortable, right? And so that means if all behavior is motivated by the desire to alleviate discomfort, that means that time management is pain management. That the reason we go off track is because we either don't know how to cope with discomfort, or we haven't fixed the source of the discomfort driving us to distraction. So that's why time management is pain management. That's why the first step to becoming indistractable, and this is a technique I I haven't really seen widely discussed. I mean, I I didn't learn it in any other book, is, is to master our internal triggers, which you'll remember from Hooked, you know, every product out there that forms a habit always attaches to an internal trigger. If you're lonely, you check Facebook or Tinder. If you're uncertain, you Google. If you're bored, you check the news or Reddit or YouTube or whatever. These products always attach to an internal trigger, an uncomfortable emotional state. So if we are to break those bad habits, if we are to, to do what it is we say we're going to do, we have to become aware of those internal triggers and have tools at our mm-hmm. disposal to do something about those internal triggers so they don't take us off track. Okay, so if we're trying to manage our time, say I'm saying I'm going to write for half an hour today and then I have this internal trigger that goes off that, that says I, I'm bored or I guess... Um, uh, Ayn Rand called it the white tennis shoe syndrome where, where she would suddenly decide that she needed to, uh, polish her tennis shoes that were in the closet or something mm-hmm. like that. Because there's some sort of internal trigger that you remember this thing that needs to be done or, or you, uh, like you were saying, feel lonely. You need to check Tinder. You feel bored. You need to check Facebook or you need to go on YouTube. And then, you know, maybe even the, the task that's happening has some way of, uh, being a conduit into this, I guess what you're calling just reducing down to pain, right? Right. right? Is like, that's the source of the internal trigger. Absolutely. So there's two things we can do. Uh, We can either fix the source of the discomfort, which we can talk about. These are typically come from things outside of us. It has to do with our workplace. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a big source of discomfort is um, the workplace culture. And there's a whole section that I talk about why distraction at work is a symptom of cultural dysfunction. It's not the technology doing it to us. It's crappy workplace culture that uses technology to create the pain people seek to escape. But we can talk about that in a minute. But what if it's just you, right? You Mm -hmm. work for yourself, you're a writer, and you sit down and you find yourself getting distracted. And by the way, I should define uh, what distraction actually is. Distraction, the opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. Distraction, traction. Exactly. They both come from the same root. They both come from the Latin trahare, which means to pull. Traction is any action. You'll notice both words end in the word action. Traction is any action that moves you towards what you want to do. It pulls you towards Mm -hmm. what you intended to do. Distraction is anything that's not that. Distraction is any action you take that pulls you away from what you planned to do. 
So what this means, there's a few things here, a few pretty profound implications. One, you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Mm-hmm. So I, I had uh, somebody that uh, when I was writing the book, I, I talked to a friend of mine and she's like super distracted. And she constantly complains about how Facebook does this and, and Twitter does this and Netflix does that. And uh, her boss does this and her kids do that. And everything's so distracting, she can't get anything done. And then I said, wow, that's, that's really tough. You know, can I see what it was that you planned to do today? Not your to-do list, because that's output. I want to see the input. Show me your calendar. What did you plan to do with this very minute that you spent complaining about how all these big bad companies are doing it to you? Show me your calendar. She takes out her calendar. It's blank. There's nothing on it. Two thirds of people don't keep a schedule. And even the third who do, most of them don't do it correctly because they Mm. are letting people just take their time whenever they feel like it. They let it, they let people steal their attention, right? The latest stupid thing on Twitter, the latest thing that Trump said, the latest thing in the news, the latest gossip in the office, whatever it might be, they just let people take their attention. Mm-hmm. They're just letting themselves be swept up in the river of whatever it is that's, that's wherever it's going to take them. That's right. So if you don't plan your day down to the minute, Okay, this is called time boxing. And I have a tool I'll give you. Uh, I built it. I kept getting asked for this oh, cool. tool that people could use because uh, uh, Google Calendar is too hard to do this. And so I built a special tool just for this. I'll give the link from the show notes. You need to create a template for your day. Okay, that says what it is you want to do with your time. Because again, you have no right to call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So what you put on your calendar is traction. Anything that's not that is distraction. And by the way, I don't care what you put on your calendar. If you want to spend your time staring into outer space, meditating, uh, playing video games. Great. Do that. But do it with intent. Do it because you want to, not because somebody else coerced you, manipulated you into doing it against your will. So in a way, it's not just the time management, it's pain management. Uh, Time management is is also intention management. That's right. That's right. But let me go back to the pain management part because I I yeah. skipped ahead a little bit, but, um, so, okay. So let's say you've, uh, you, 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 you've sat down at your desk, you're going to do the writing time. So there are three strategies you can, you, you can use to cope with discomfort. You can reimagine the trigger, you can reimagine the task, and you can reimagine your temperament. And so these three tactics are how we cope with discomfort. Uh, and, and so I draw from acceptance and commitment therapy. I draw from a bunch of different tools that help you deal with that discomfort in a healthier manner. Starting with, by the way, this this notion that uh, we have to dispose of, which is that somehow if we're not happy all the time, like the self-help industry loves to tell us that if we're not happy, Mm. we're not normal. If we're not satisfied that we're not normal, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, That we have to realize that as a species, we are designed to be perpetually perturbed. We are designed to be dissatisfied. It's about how we cope with that discomfort. But don't be one of these people who tells themselves, oh, I'm not loving this, right? Like I must not be into it. I must not be the kind of person who can do this. I must have a short attention span or addictive personality. All that stuff is is bogus. Have a growth mindset about it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So we can dive deeper. I don't want to keep labeling on, (laughs) but... Well, I like this idea though. I, I want to know more about this uh, sure. reimagining the trigger. Uh, so I'm, I'm sitting there, I, I, I want to write yeah. for half an hour and uh, a, a trigger comes up. Let's say, yeah, I, I suddenly want to go to Twitter. Yeah. So the first step, there's, there's four steps here. The first step is to look for the emotion preceding the distraction. Okay. Okay. So just by becoming aware of what is that sensation Mm -hmm. that makes you want to escape is incredibly empowering just by, by identifying it. So instead of, you know, very quickly going to your phone, I want to just check Twitter for a second. You're asking yourself, you're almost talking to yourself as a narrator. Hmm, there I go reaching for my phone, right? So you're, you're, you're noticing that. And by doing that, you get to step two, which is to write down the internal trigger. By the way, this comes from acceptance and commitment therapy. This isn't uh, Nier's personal program. Uh, Everything in the book, you, you, you got the book. So you saw there are tons of citations. It's not just my personal recipe. All of this stuff is backed by peer reviewed studies. So the second step is to write down the internal trigger. So, okay, I've got my little distraction tracker. I can give you a link for that in the show notes as well. I want to pick up cell phone to check Twitter because I'm feeling bored. This writing is hard. Mm -hmm. I'm stressed. I'm anxious. Whatever that emotion is, I want you to write it down. 
Then, okay, so here's what most people do as step three. Step three, even if they get that far, most people will say, push it down. Don't feel it. There's something wrong with me. I'm broken. I'm deficient. We talk to ourselves in this way. It's horrible. We are so mean to ourselves. Instead- That's a downward spiral right there. Exactly. And why is it a downward spiral? Because that makes you feel worse. What do you do to feel better when you feel bad, when you feel more of an internal trigger? You become even more likely to get distracted. It's exactly why I used to overeat. I didn't eat because I was hungry. I eat because I felt bad. And the more I ate, the worse I felt about myself. And the solution to that was more eating. (laughs) And that begins to uh, change your identity. Mm-hmm. Two, you become, you become, oh, I'm the type of person who can't focus. I'm the type of person right. who uh, can't control his appetite, etc. That's right. And that is super, super toxic. So instead, step three is not to beat yourself up. It's to explore the negative sensation with curiosity instead of contempt. Mm-hmm. We just explore it. We just get into it for a minute. And so what I do almost on a daily basis, remember becoming indistractable doesn't mean you never get distracted. It means you strive to do what you say you're going to do. So I don't get distracted again and again and again by the same thing, right? The What what is that definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expecting Mm -hmm. different results, right? I know why I get distracted now. And so one of the techniques I use very often is this 10 minute rule where for 10 minutes, I can give into that distraction, okay? I can I can eat that, cupcake that uh, I'm trying to resist. I can go check Twitter. I can do whatever that distraction is in 10 minutes. Sometimes I'll I'll actually just set an alarm. Sometimes I'll just look at my clock, Mm. but sometimes I'll actually just set a quick timer and be like, yep, no problem. I can check Twitter in 10 minutes. And what that allows you to do is use this technique called surfing the urge, because it turns out that these negative sensations, they're just emotions. They're just emotions. They come and go. And if you allow yourself to surf the urge with curiosity instead of contempt, what you will find is that by the time those 10 minutes are up, the emotion has crested and, and subsided. So my mom used to do this to me all the time. I'd say, I, I want this toy. And then she would say, well, you know, if you still want it in three weeks, uh, then, then you can have it. Yeah. And then I you would forget, forget about it. <laughs> exactly. So this is, this, that's not too dissimilar, right? You want it so bad. I want it. I want it. I want it. Okay. Well, if you still want it in three weeks, no problem. It's yours. And then you get something else, you know, you, something else grabs your attention. When you're five, yeah, you're, you don't have a three-week attention span. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and when you're uh, 45, uh, the same technique works on, on, a, on a shorter, uh, uh, on, a, a, on fewer minutes. You only need 10 minutes. Yeah. Hopefully. And then the, the fourth technique, just to wrap up the, this idea of reimagining the internal trigger, is to be cautious of liminal moments. So liminal moments are really dangerous. Liminal moments are those moments between things. Okay. So, so you know what I'm talking about, right? It's, uh, uh, I'm on my way back to my desk after a meeting, I'm checking my uh, Facebook or I'm checking email or whatever. And then you get to your desk and then you just do a few more minutes, a few more minutes, a few more minutes, and you've just spent 30 minutes. So we want to be really cautious about those liminal moments. And we want to set cues for ourselves to reimagine the internal triggers so that when we get back to our desk, we know, oh, okay, the clock has struck nine o'clock. That in my calendar means that this is my time for writing, email, whatever it is that I decided to do and do it without getting trapped by those liminal moments between events. Okay, so I'm sitting there, I, I, I want to write, I have the, the, uh, the internal trigger that I, 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 I want to check Twitter, so then I write that down, um, that I want to check Twitter because, and then I'm examining mm-hmm. my own emotions there, and then, um, so, but I, I also am worried about liminal moments, um, and in those liminal moments, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of, I've used this internal trigger thing a little bit. Um, you know, you know, uh, Manish from Pavlock, uh, when I was hooked on Facebook, I would feel that trigger yeah. and then I would go ahead and, and, uh, shock myself. And then that sort of, uh, got rid of the distraction I wanted to. Are you still using the Pavlock? I only had to use it like once. Huh. And what, what were you trying to stop yourself from doing? From uh, scanning the Facebook feed. And you've never scanned it again? Um, I ne- I've never had the same problem that I did huh. before I started. So I would, I would look at the top news feed item and then I would allow myself to feel that feeling, just like you're talking about, this internal trigger. And then I mm-hmm. shocked myself. And then I immediately started sweeping the floor and changing light bulbs and you know doing all this stuff. <laughs> and then I didn't, I, the first time I did it, I, I then didn't look at beyond the first newsfeed item for 
a month. And I'm not even uh-huh. exaggerating. A month. Yeah. And then from then yeah. I had it control under control. And these days I just completely block it. Yeah. So I can't even see it. Have you ever used it for any, uh, anything else? Any other distractions that you're trying to stop? Uh, well, there's been some things I tried to try to do um, that didn't work as well. Like I would, I would like mm. mutter cuss words under my voice when I got aggravated with something. Uh. <laughs> and so I would like try to shock myself with that. It didn't particularly work for that thing for me. I think mm. it works for some people, but, mm. but this idea of, of being able to feel the trigger, I think is, is really, um, is really powerful and important. And I think it's something that you can pay attention to uh, all day long Mm. Uh, and make a, make a habit of, um, of, of examining those triggers and finding ways to, um, well, I guess connect those triggers to the actions that you then want to do. Right. Is to understand that. Right. Exactly. That you're understanding, oh, this is why I'm doing it. Right. Because if we don't understand the deeper reason why we are doing these things, Mm -hmm. we'll find something. Right. We'll, we'll always find something. Oh, let me just clean my desk or take out the trash or whatever. You know, like uh, uh, you'll find that distraction unless you know what you are trying to escape. Yeah. And, and many times distraction fools us, right? We, we say to ourselves, oh, I don't feel like writing, but email is kind of productive. I should probably do that for a minute. But no, that yes. is also a distraction if that's not what you plan to do with your time. So is there a way to take these triggers and reprogram them? So that we instead do the things that we intend to yes, do? Yes, absolutely. So that's that's the next part. So we can reimagine our triggers, we can reimagine the task, and we can reimagine our temperament. So reimagining okay. the task is about learning to reduce the discomfort associated with the task by learning to play anything. And this comes from the work of, of Ian Bogost, who is a, a professor at Georgia Tech, And he has done some really fascinating work about how to turn any task into play, starting with this kind of grim reality that play doesn't have to be fun. You don't have to enjoy play. It just has to reduce the pain of the task. So he hates the Mary Poppins spoonful of sugar idea. He thinks it's a terrible idea. Because Mm. what spoonful of sugar tells you to do, and we've seen this everywhere, right? Like, hey, do this shitty job and I'll pay a bunch of money. Um, you know, we do this with our kids. Mm-hmm. If you do this and this, I'll give you a gold star. It's all about the extrinsic rewards. And we know that that has some pretty serious consequences. It reduces creativity. It's not bad for temporary tasks. It's terrible for things we have to do again and again and again, or things that require creativity or, you know, extra effort. Uh, people will just do whatever they do, uh, as quickly and as, as you know, least expensive a way they possibly can from a, from an effort perspective just to get the reward. Instead, what, what Bogus advises and what I advise in the book, is to learn to turn any task into play, not with an extrinsic reward, but by using some of the very same principles I describe in Hooked that companies use to get us hooked, to use what's called a variable reward. So what we do is we don't try and disassociate from the task. What we do instead is to focus more intensely on the task. And then we look for the variability. So Bogos actually talks about how he used to hate cutting his grass. And then he actually now loves cutting his grass. How can that be? Cutting your grass sounds horrible. Well, he got, he focused more intensely on it. He learned everything he could possibly learn about how grass grows and the different seeds he could use. And he looked for the variability, Mm -hmm. right? The uncertainty of, well, what if I cut it this way? And what if I go in this pattern? And what if I use this fertilizer? He looked more intensely in the task. And you think, well, that's crazy. I'm never going to learn how to love to cut the grass. But is it that crazy? I mean, think about, you know, I I have a friend who's crazy about coffee. Now, I like coffee, but this guy is obsessed with the burr grinder and the beans and single origin this and that. I think this is incredibly boring, but he just thinks it's the coolest thing in the world, right? Most people, to become a barista, you have to pay them, right? But he would do it for free. Uh, I have um, another friend who's a car buff. You know, to me, let me just pay you some money and fix my car. No, no, no. He's obsessed with it. He loves it. He gets so into it because he looks for the, the, the variability in it. Uh, I have another friend who lives in San Francisco. She is an unbelievable crafter. I mean, she, she can knit these incredible quilts and she puts in hour after hour of her time because all of these examples are people who have learned to play the experience, not by disassociating, not the spoonful of sugar, that's terrible advice, but instead by learning to focus more intensely on it and look for the variability in the experience. This is interesting. And I think 
it's something that you can do even with things that you aren't necessarily that automatically interested in. Yeah. Like, for example, I've been doing it with, uh, I've wanted to learn more about storytelling. Well, mm. there's lots of great storytelling in fiction books. Well, I don't really like to read, read fiction books, but I do like to watch movies. Mm. So I started reading screenplays of my favorite movies. And then after I read the screenplay of, of my favorite movies, I would then go read the novel that was, was the screenplay was then based off of. So I started like changing these activities, uh, finding, the one little entry point that I can find where I am interested in something that's related to this topic and then using that to pull me in and then yeah. get me uh, more, more deeply ingrained with, with, uh, with the topic. Beautiful. So, so with my writing, whenever I, I find myself not enjoying the task, which happens often, right? You have a lot of internal triggers yes. to writing, you know, boredom, anxiety. Is anybody going to like this? This sucks. I don't know what the answer is. I've been researching this and I still don't know what, how to make heads or tails of it. I ask myself that I, I repeat this mantra, follow your curiosity. Mm -hmm. The curiosity is the fuel to keep exploring, to keep discovering, to keep wanting to learn. That's the fuel. And that is also an internal trigger, but it's a better internal trigger than giving into the internal trigger of, of boredom and anxiety. Boredom and anxiety, uh, if we don't learn to cope with them, with the reimagining techniques we talked about earlier, they can lead us to distraction. Whereas if we use the internal trigger of curiosity, that can lead us to traction. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's why I call it strategic curiosity. Mm, yep. So there's also temperament. Yeah. Um, reimagining the temperament. Right. So that's the last, by the way, this is just one of four big buckets. There are four big techniques, uh, master internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back external triggers, and uh, prevent distraction with packs. Everything we've talked about so far is about this first technique of mastering internal triggers. And so the last of the three is about uh, reimagining your temperament. And temperament is defined as this inherent trait uh, that an individual possesses. And what, what I found is that there are so many self-defeating beliefs that we have about the way we are, right? This is just the way I am. Mm -hmm. One of those that I, identity. identity has a lot to do with identity, a lot to do with identity because we can, we can begin to internalize this. And we know that behavior changes, identity change, long-term behavior change necessitates identity change. Now, the problem is that there's a lot of bad information out there about your temperament. One of, one of the, the, uh, research studies I talk about that I think is particularly harmful uh, is this idea of ego depletion. That it's, there's a well-known, uh, both in you know the popular folk psychology as well as you know for, uh, for a few years in, in, in the you know, academic community, this idea of ego depletion. Ego depletion says that willpower is a limited resource, that you are spent, you are out of willpower, just like you would be out of gas in a gas tank. Uh, so this promoter, this idea was studied and promoted in a book called Willpower. But then a few years ago, a few researchers said, this, this sounds fishy. And other researchers decided to try and replicate the studies, and they couldn't. So several meta-analysis have found that ego depletion doesn't exist. It's not true. It's not real. Unless there is one group of people who actually do experience ego depletion, the one group of people who actually do experience ego depletion, this study was done by Carol Dweck at Stanford, the only people who experience ego depletion are people who believe ego depletion is true, as I did. Mm. So I'd come home after a long day of work. Oh, boy, I'm spent. I'm out of willpower. You know, I, there's, I just, no more self-control. Give me that pint of Ben and Jerry's and let's turn on some Netflix. I'm spent. I'm out. I have no more energy, no more willpower. And so this is so bad because we believe the story we've made up, this myth. And of course, the research, the bad research has now perpetuated that myth that just ain't true. And so this is why I kind of get so, you know, so emotional about what, what I currently see in the media these days and by some tech critics who are, are making a living by spreading fear, telling us that technology is addicting us, that it's hijacking our brains. By telling us this, they are essentially making it true. It's called learned helplessness. When you tell people technology is hijacking your brain, 
Your kids are addicted to social media. And by the way, asterisks here. Some people really are addiction addicted. There is such a thing as a pathology. Addiction is a real pathology that some people, one to five percent of the population, experience based on you know different different uh, uh, mediums they might get addicted to. But for the vast majority of us, 95, 99% of us, we're not addicted to this stuff. We overuse it from time to time. And so believing this nonsense gives these companies more power and more credit than they deserve. And so that's why it's so important that we reimagine our temperament. Hmm. I have to say, though, this ego depletion thing is just so hard to, uh, for, for me to believe. And it makes me wonder, and I don't want to get us too far off track, and maybe this is... This is uh, you know, something that still needs to be studied, but like, I still believe in ego depletion, but I have a growth mindset about ego depletion. Mm. As I go throughout my day, I'm looking or I'm listening to my brain for that moment of, is this going to drain me? Mm. And if I feel like it's going to drain me, then I manage my energy. So, okay, I want to get to the point where I can, uh, you know, feel like I completed something before, I run out of this amount of this, this energy. And I'm, that's like a habit that I'm like constantly cultivating. And it's resulted in like, I have a lot fewer of these, you know, uh, internet induced, uh, comas or whatever, yeah. where you wake up four hours later and you have a hundred tabs open or something. So I don't know. I wonder about that. I don't well, know if you have anything well, to just say to be clear. Just to be clear about what ego depletion really means, ego depletion doesn't mean you don't get tired after a task. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you don't uh, uh, feel that you have expended a lot of energy on a task. It just means that your power to resist, uh -huh. your willpower, your ability to say no to, to something is somehow spent up. That's what ego depletion is all about. So you, yeah, if you take a math test for an hour and a half, you're going to be tired. <laughs> that's that's going to happen. If you run, you're going to get tired. What what ego depletion says then that your ability to make a tough choice and resist temptation and not have a candy bar or a donut is somehow you know gone if you do something difficult. Uh, and that's the part that's not really? true unless you believe it's Does true. Does this include the chocolate cake study with the uh, yep. the, the digits? The that granola was a, bar a, a non replicable cannot replicate. Unless you believe it's true. <laughs> well, I believe it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so but, but, but be careful. You're, you're self-sabotaging yourself. So, um, so what do you do then if you say, okay, well, but clearly this, I feel this. And you're absolutely right. You know, you feel it. Uh -huh. So Michael Inslet, he's a, he's a professor at, I think, University of Toronto. He says that, he, that willpower is not a depletable resource. That's the wrong way to think about it. Instead, the right way to think about it is to think about it as an emotion. That I wouldn't say to you, hey, David, it was really great having this conversation, but you know what? I'm sorry. I ran out of happy. Uh huh. Or, you know, I was mad at you the other day and then I ran out of sad. That doesn't make any sense. Equally, yeah. it doesn't make sense to say, oh, I ran out of willpower. Can't make any more good decisions. These are emotions. And just as we talked about around surfing the urge and learning to deal with those uncomfortable emotional sensations with the 10 minute rule, the same rules apply here. Huh. What about like the, the judges that, you know, right before they eat lunch, they, they, they make unfavorable rulings. And then right after lunch, they, they make, you know, more favorable or, or, you know, nicer rulings. I don't know if you've heard anything about that. Yeah. Yeah. The last time I heard, I don't think that replicated either. <laughs> There's uh yeah, I'm sure you've been following this, uh, this replication crisis that's been going on in social psychology. What did I go to college for? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. There's a lot of studies that have been overturned recently. Not that they've been overturned. This is what happens in science, right? One uh, one researcher makes a claim, typically it's these claims that uh, make for great headlines that the media likes, and it turns out there was p-hacking going on, or the, the yeah. study didn't look at other results. But this is what's supposed to happen in the scientific process. It doesn't, and it, there's still hypotheses. Hey, look, they might replicate in the future. There might there might be, you know, the study wasn't conducted correctly, etc. But uh, but it turns out, by the way, that that judge study, there might have been a lot of other things going on. That, that might not also not be ego depletion per se. That could just be, I'm hungry. <laughs> and uh -huh. When I'm hungry, I'm bad mood, hangry. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. hangriness exists. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I could, maybe. I could, I would buy the fact, I would buy that people feel hunger. And when they feel hunger, that's an internal trigger that could distract them from uh, focusing their attention on what they want to do. I'd buy that. I can see what you're saying. Those are actually completely different things then. So anyway, we, we really went over how to master internal triggers. There's so much more about how to, uh, gain traction and stay away from distraction. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we mentioned a little bit earlier about 
work culture. I don't think we get time to talk about that because there's one thing that I really loved uh, in the book that I would love to hear more of your thoughts on. And that is this idea of multi-channel multitasking. Oh, you like that one. Right? So multitasking mm-hmm. is a myth, right? We've heard this over and over again now. You can't multitask. Yeah. But you're saying that's not true. The myth of multitasking is a is myth. It's a myth. Is a myth. See, this is what I, this is why I love writing because I love turning over apple carts. I love having my apple cart overturned. <laughs> like when somebody changes my mind on something, to me, that's like a, yes. a mini mind orgasm. I love it. I don't know if any, anybody else appreciates it. Some, I have a, you know, Brian Holiday, right? He's like, uh, he told me one time, he's like, uh, you're kind of like Socrates. You know, you, you like, you like poking, uh, the box a lot and, 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 uh, making people think twice about things. And you know what they did to Socrates? They killed him. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm not, I'm, Corrupting yeah, the youth. Exactly, exactly. But okay, so let's talk about, about multitasking. Multitasking is not exactly the right term for what people mean when they say you can't multitask. You can't multi-channel. I'm sorry, you can't you can't um task switch. That's very difficult. You can't go from one uh source of information on the same source of information and switch back and forth. That's very, very difficult to do. So for example, if I put uh, a podcast playing in one ear and a different podcast playing in the other ear, you wouldn't be able to concentrate on either one without, uh, sorry, on both without concentrating on one or the other. You couldn't um, simultaneously hear both podcasts at once. I couldn't ask you to do two math problems at Mm -hmm. once. You couldn't do that because it's using the same sensory channel. So in that respect, you're right. We can't uh, we can't multitask when it comes to the same channel, the same sensory channel. However, the exception here is that we are perfectly good at multitasking on different channels. So we all know that you can chew gum and walk at the same time. We do all kinds of things. We multitask all kinds of things at the same time. So what I recommend, that one of the ways that we can get more out of our days is by strategically multi-channel multitasking. And so this uses a few techniques that I really love. Uh, one of them is called temptation bundlings. Temptation bundling is when you take something that is rewarding and fulfilling and enjoyable to you in one environment and you use it to kind of create an incentive or to create uh, intrinsic joy for something that you may not like as much. So in my case, uh, I always hated exercise for as long as I can remember. As I mentioned, I used to be clinically obese. Like ex- I didn't understand what anybody was talking when they say runner's high or like I just run a marathon. It was so awesome. I didn't know what the hell you were talking. I, I, I have always hated exercise until I started using this technique called temptation bundling. And so I have always loved listening to great content, reading great content, listening to great content. So I use this app called Pocket and I have a rule that anytime I see an article online that I want to read, I never read it on my desktop. That's my rule. I never read on my desktop because I know those websites, mm-hmm. New York Times, uh, Lifehacker, like TechCrunch, wherever you get your, your news and information, they are designed to hook you just as much as Facebook is. I know New York Times says that Facebook is horrible and all that stuff. They are in the same exact business. They are in the attention economy. They are attention merchants. They want your time to sell you ads. Don't let them. And the way you don't let them is that you don't read stuff online. You put, you put this app called Pocket on, on the Chrome of your browser. You hit the button. It goes to an app on your phone. It scrubs out all the ads and it reads them to you for free anytime you want with this little, you know, like a uh, Siri type voice. So what I did is I used multi-channel multitasking. So every time oh, I'm in the cool. gym, when I'm on the treadmill, instead of sitting there bored, guess what? I am listening to articles. And that is an example of multi-channel multitasking and reward bundling. So that's a triple win, right? Because I'm not distracted when I'm on my desktop, when I see an article I want to read. I'm in the gym exercising and I get to do this thing I enjoy and read these articles that you know hopefully educate me and, and, and uh, help feed my brain. That is very cool. I love that because this conversation is going to be posted to the Patreon supporters pretty close after we're done. And then I'm going to listen to it through my own RSS while I cook. There you and go. I'm going to listen to it a few times over and over again. And then I'll uh, figure out how to edit it. I'll figure out how to write the intro for it, etc. That's multi-channel multitasking. Yeah, we can do this in other aspects. Yeah. Exactly. You, you could take a, a walking meeting with a friend from the office, right? Instead of sitting in some boring conference room, take a walking meeting. You, you serve your values of keeping your body healthy as well as you know, time for a colleague or a friend. So there's many different, you know, cooking healthy food, as you mentioned, while you're listening to an audiobook or a podcast. Absolutely. That is awesome. Well, 
there's so much more in the book. There's the things about the, the work culture that we didn't get to. People will have to buy the book and, and check that out. I really recommend it. It's amazing. And where would people find more of you? Or I guess they should go buy the book. <laughs> yeah, so let's see. So uh, my blog is at nearandfar.com. Uh, near is spelled like my first name, N-I-R. And uh, if you want more information about the book, the book is called Indistractable. My first book is called Hooked. My next book is called Indistractable. Uh, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And there are all kinds of resources, the distraction tracker, uh, the, the, the template that helps you um, uh, create a weekly calendar template, uh, a 80-page workbook that we didn't, I couldn't fit in the book. It would have been too long, but that's all available all at indistractable.com. So it's I-N- distract able indistractable.com it's able not A-B-L-E. ible yeah i made okay. up the word so <laughs> awesome thank you so much near great having you back on the show thank you and, and a proud member of the three-time club I, f- I feel like i should like have streamers and confetti yeah i'll, I'll bring out your three-timer club robe oh yes shortly. i can't yeah. wait thank you Is Love Your Work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world. The world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash This is a different kind of model for supporting the work that you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars, put your money where your mind is, and keep love your work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at patreon.com slash cadavy. That's patreon.com slash K-A, D as in David, A, V as in Victor, Y. And if you can't support the show financially and you've listened to at least three episodes, can you do me a favor? Write a review on Apple Podcasts. You can consider it your donation to help support the show. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsor Paula Spriggs and top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pankovicius. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>